So I got in last night, yesterday, and we were at this, there's a little cigar shop down here, if anybody's into cigars, and it turns out that the, uh, the bartender, she's a chemist during the day. So I go in with this, and there's another guy sitting there, and she said, what do you have? And I said, I'll, I'll have H2O. And the guy goes, I'll have H2O too. He died. <laughs> that was my opening joke. <laughs> So how do you start an open source project? And I'm very qualified because I've made every mistake you can make. And then, uh, like the first one is my stuff isn't working now. Oh, I told you I was a PC guy. Do you have to talk to Siri to make it work? Yeah, Cortana. Hang on a second, bear with me. There we go, there we go. Hello, my name is. That's me. So what's that mean? Who cares? You all know who I am. Just like you, I'm a developer, so we're awesome, right? I'm actually a developer at heart. Even though I'm a developer advocate, I am a developer. <clears throat> and I can still remember writing my first program, as uh, you probably remember your first program. And now I, uh, two years ago, I started at Rackspace as a developer advocate, which means I get to write code, I get to go to conferences, I get to write articles, I get to help customers, and for me it's the perfect job. It's absolutely the perfect job. So that's a little bit of my background. Uh, before that, I was actually a Formula One driver, and um, that was interesting. And then uh, <laughs> I was a sports writer for a while, and that's true. And that was really good training for working on a deadline and learning how to write, which I think as a developer is important. And I was also the youngest astronaut in the history of NASA. <laughs> And I love it at Code of the Beach because I actually do like to surf. I have a couple of long boards. I couldn't bring them, but if anybody wants to go surfing, please let me know. So today we're going to talk about how to start an open source project. And this is coming from someone who previously knew nothing about open source. Um, I worked in the .NET world. And there was just, this was back before two years ago when there was no open source in .NET. In fact, uh, my favorite story is I was working for a large uh, drugstore company, and I had a project, and I had some JavaScript, and I found an open source project to do this JavaScript. So I downloaded it and put it into the repo. Uh, team found Visual Source Safe, and this is only two years ago. And checked it in, moved it into uh, to testing, and they came back and said, "Yo, we can't." You can't use open source software. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean? I can't use open source. It's like, well, we don't know, you know, if it's any good. Like, you trust me to write code, but you don't trust me to get code that someone else wrote that's been like tested by thousands of people. And they're like, no, no open source. So I'm like, all right. So I'm back to my desk. I open Notepad, copy the code in, take just the part I need, paste it into the ASPX page as a function, checked it in, and there was no problem. So. <laughs> That was my exposure then to open source. So I get to Rackspace where everything's open source. I mean, we, we do OpenStack, you may have heard of that. It's a cloud operating system that, OpenStack, that Rackspace and NASA started uh, five years ago. And everything's open source. And I'm coming into this like, I don't know what I'm doing. I just, I'm totally, like, they're talking Git and repos and, and pulls and pushes and commits, and I'm like, I just like, what is going on here? So I got a little training, uh, uh, just enough to be dangerous, and decided that I would start this project uh, and make it open source, which we're encouraged to do. So to do an open source project, you can just go up to GitHub and start a project and be done, but that's not really, that's what I did, and <laughs> it doesn't really work out so great. So the first thing that you have to do is you need an idea. And that sounds real simple, but it's not as easy as it sounds because a lot of things have, have already been done, right? You know, it's, everything's been invented syndrome. So you, you're either gonna come up with a novel idea that no one's done, which would be awesome, or maybe you take someone else's idea and fork it and improve it or make it work right. So you need, an, you need, an, well, you need a good idea. <laughs> That's a bad idea. You need a good idea. So I came up with the idea that uh, <clears throat> PowerShell should talk to OpenStack. OpenStack has all these APIs, and we have SDKs, that's the team I'm on, in every language that you can think of, including the .NET framework, but there's nothing in PowerShell. 
And so I said, well, if I do a PowerShell thing, that's kind of catching on. I don't know how many people here get into PowerShell, but it's really picking up steam. And the more you look at it, it's, it's actually pretty good. It actually is. So I went to my manager, and she said it was a good idea. Um, so I went ahead with it. And it was last December. I started December 2014. And this will take three months, right? I'm still working on it. So it's programmer time. So the first thing I came up with was a name for it. Now, that sounds really silly, but if you work in anything open source, you know how there's just, there's, there's like, play on word names, like the package for the SDK for Ruby for OpenStack Cloud is called Fog. Ha, I get it, Fog Cloud. So there's the, there's, there's the cutesy names. And then there's the names that make no sense at all. And I, I'm at a loss for that. And then there's names that kind of convey what they are. So the first thing I thought of was uh, Stackinator, because I'm, I'm a fan of a, a certain cartoon um, I don't know if anybody catches what this is. And then uh, the Stackinator 5000. Does anybody get this? Wow. No Phineas and Ferb fans. The best cartoon ever. So Stackinator 5000, like, that was kind of a joke. And then I thought Power Stackinator. I'm like, okay, that's kind of corny. And then the Baconator was taken. <laughs> so I came up with Posh Stack. Posh, it turns out, it's not like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the whole song, but it's, it's, a, it's a real common shorthand for PowerShell. And I didn't know this when I was getting into it, but I found this out. And then Stack for OpenStack. So the first thing you gotta do is come up with a name, and you want a name that means something. This means something to me. <laughs> it means, if you, but if you, know, if you saw the name and you knew what it was for, you would remember it. Like there was, before that, there was Posh Nova. What does that mean? Nova was just one part of OpenStack, and there was, Another one was a power stack. So it's, that sounds like something you find at a gym. So I came up with posh stack. As it turns out, this project is getting split into open stack and rack space. So the other one's going to be called posh rack. So that's perfect. So I just got really fortunate on that one. By the way, this is an hour session. I might be able to let you out early. So, because I'm kind of flying. <coughs> So the first thing is get a good name and spend some time on it and look around. We've had projects where internally where someone comes up with a name and they'll start down the road and then they find out that there's something else completely unrelated with the same name. It's like, oh, that stinks. Like, there's a language called Go. You may have heard of it. I actually am very much like Go. There's also a continuous integration and continuous development project product for .NET, well, for anything, but it's called Go. So that was a, the duh. I mean, that's not a good idea. So that was really hard. And don't call it, if you call it like access, that's great until you try to do a web search for it. And then it's like, oh boy. So think about the name. That's, that sounds silly, but you know, think about what you want to call it. The next thing is where are you going to put it? Now that sounds real simple. And for me, you know, it was just like, well, I have a GitHub repo. I'll just put up my GitHub repo. Um, so that's naturally what I did. Well, that was really stupid because now it's tied to my GitHub repo, and yet it's an OpenStack Rackspace project. So I, that, that was the first mistake I made, was I put it in the wrong place. So now what we have to do is I have to move it, and that's a problem because then if you go to my end, I'm gonna have to redirect you. So. Think about where you're gonna put it. If it's just you, a little project, that's fine. But if you work in a company that has a repo, or like we have multiple repos, I'm not, so we have multiple organizations, we have Rack Space, we have Racker Labs, and of course we all have our own. So think about where you wanna put the thing so that people can find it and it's gonna stay there. It, it, you want it to stay there after you're gone, so to speak. Not technically, but you'll see later. So that's the first mistake I made. So, I, and I still haven't fixed that. There are mistakes that I made that I haven't fixed. And uh, I was gonna do it before this, and I was like, yeah, you know what, I'll leave them. It's like, this is real. <laughs> so what's a good first commit? 
Who, who in here has done an open source project? Why are you here? <laughs> I mean, well, you're, you've done this. We've done it wrong. No, 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 well, it's great. This is the blind leading the blind. They'll both fall into the ditch. So what's a, what's a good first commit? License. You can tell she works for like Google. <laughs> wrong. No. No, you are right, but that's funny because you just jumped ahead about 15 slides. No, no, what's the very, if you open, if you create a new project in, in GitHub, what does it tell you? Read yes, who said that? Readme. The readme is the first, a really good first commit. And that could, and the license. <laughs> so, and you want to nail the readme. It's really that, it really is that important. It's, this is not, uh, it's not your project, and we'll, I'll get into that later. But as it's, it's, soon as you put it up there, it's not yours. That's very key to remember. So how do you want to nail it? Well, it should, has to include some stuff. This is what mine looks like. Um, it's excellent. <laughs> and of course, I think that. Uh, but I'm not sure. So you, you want to get some parts to it. You want to, you know, it should have, you want a description of the project, obviously. So make sure you get a description that tells, you know, what is it? Don't just say, a, you know, it's PowerShell. You know, in my case, it's PowerShell client for OpenStack, and it has the goal, so there's a description. You, and then you want installation, and that's important. And it's, this is easy to screw up, because I've, as a not open source C person and a mostly Windows E person until recently, I would work in a group of people that were not Windows people, uh, which is putting it nicely. And they'd say, oh, you gotta install this to run this SDK. You're gonna, I'm gonna install, I'm gonna do the Python SDK. So in, run this. So there's apt get or whatever, the Linux stuff you run. And I'm like, well, it doesn't work. Well, did you install this prerequisite? Well, no. I'm on Windows. And so there was all this back and forth. You got to do this, you got to do this. That should all be in your installation instructions. And make sure that you get like somebody that's not you to go through and do it. And if you really want to do it, if it supports like Windows, Linux, and Mac, make sure you get L Windows, Linux, and Mac people that don't bleed over to the other side to do it. Right? So get a Windows person who's like a Windows idiot and like, I don't know anything about Bash. I just love Windows. And when I say idiot, I mean it in a nice way. They're just like, I love Windows and that's all I want to do. And say, go follow the instructions. And then when they mess up, say, okay, I need to include that. Because you, it's, you'll, you'll do it. You will mess it up. You will get it wrong. And you'll make assumptions because that's just human nature. You know, it's like, you know, go down to the last tree and turn left. Well, that doesn't help me. You want some configuration information, and this is a lot like the installation. Make sure you cover everything. Installation and configuration, again, forward slash or backslash. Are you in Windows or are you in POSIX? I mean, there's a, right there. It's a little thing that you can easily overlook, right? We have a, a tool at work. It's a command line tool for, the, for Rackspace. And they were like, well, you just run this. And I'm like, no, you don't just run this. Anybody that knows PowerShell knows if you're going to run an exe, I have to put dot slash name of the exe. Like, well, yeah. I'm like, no, you can't just, well, yeah. I mean, you have to anticipate these things in your installation and configuration. They're like, well, it's going to go in your home directory. I am in Windows. I don't have a home directory. There is a, you know, I have a slash user slash Don. That's my home directory, but I don't have home. I don't even use that terminology as a Windows person like you guys do in, in Linux. You have to cross those chasms. You have to think about this stuff. And then how to contribute. Make sure you please do this for your own sanity. Make sure how to contribute and make it as easy as possible. And it could be as simple as send email. I mean, that's not the ideal way, but if you, whatever you need to do to encourage people to contribute, you want to put that there. So your readme, you want to really nail that, because that's the first thing that people are going to see. So here's, I have the description, and these little tags are cool. I'll get into that. Installation is so easy. See how you do it? You a little marketing speak there. That's right. And, and, and look, I mean, check this out. Look how great this is. There's your configuration stuff. 
And it's all been looked over. And look, you see, and then even a little PowerShell thing in there. Contributing is a cinch as well. Try to encourage and make it, you know, hey, it's a cinch. You can just jump right in there and do it. Look, look at this. You can for pick an issue, get coding. If you're not sure, choose an issue. Even, even ask, just ask for assistance. You want to encourage people to jump in because trust me, you're going to need it. Does anybody in here, who's familiar with Markdown? Who writes in Markdown? Okay, so half of you have. The other half haven't. Well, I was in the other half, and I'm in a meeting at work. <laughs> like, hey, we'll do it in Markdown. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm on Google. What, is the, what in the world's Markdown? I, had, I Seriously, I had no idea what Markdown was. I mean, I just, I, I, I opened Microsoft Word, right? So Markdown. So it's another way to format text that you have to learn. But you don't just any Markdown. No, you have to learn GitHub flavored Markdown. So there's going to be that part of it, right? It's like, I know Markdown. Well, there's some, you know, there's some tricks to it. It's not major, but there is GitHub flavored Markdown. You're going to write all your documentation in Markdown. You might as well grab an editor that supports it. I use one called Atom, which is fantastic. Um, that's just my opinion. <coughs> But it, it's, it has some differences, and you're going to want to know this stuff. And that makes the world go around. So what about the second commit? What's a good idea for that? Well, you might have a document outlining the project. Something that says, here's what this project's going to do, and, 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 and here's how I see the progression of it. You might have a piece of working code. In my case, I think it was uh, the authentication piece, just to show that it worked. Uh, it also demonstrates the approach you're taking, maybe coding standards, maybe whatever frameworks you're using, standards, uh, any prerequisite uh, dependencies, which if you can minimize those, please do that. But it, uh, this first commit, the second commit, something that just shows a little inkling of what's coming, right? Because again, this is not your project. And then, then you're off to races. Do another, just do another commit and do another one. And then it's like, it starts to get fun. And that's when you have to stop. You just have to stop. I made this mistake. I started writing code. I was like, this is awesome. Commit, 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 push, push, commit, commit, comments, push. And I'm racing along. And I'm like, wait a minute. You just have to stop and think about this. At this point, you have to ask yourself some questions. Are you heading in the right direction? Because you know how it is a software project. It's very simple to start coding and then start thinking. And are you going to make any changes? And are they going to be breaking changes? Right? And that's not a minor thing because this is a public project. You have this on GitHub. At this point, there may be someone already using the code. Now you really have a problem. Now, how would I know that? Um, <laughs> you need to proceed carefully uh, and with a plan. And because uh, if you don't, you might make changes that could break stuff. I mean, I've heard. Um, so what is a good cadence? What's a good way to know when to commit code or push code? I mean, what's a good, is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it, you know, how do you know? How do you know what speed to go at? You know, you don't want to go too slow because people don't see progress. They're like, well, this project's dead. I'm, if you've done any open source stuff, you open a project and you look at it and you go, well, no one's touched this in three years, so I'm not, it's probably stale. Not necessarily, but that's the way you think. On the other hand, if there's something happening too quick, it's like, oh, is this even stable? I, um, as a, I have, I'm one of the seven people in America that use the, uh, and love the Windows Phone. And, uh, <clears throat> and if, if you would cover your ears, I absolutely hate Android with a passion. So, uh, sorry. So I got a Windows Phone, I absolutely love it. So. About a week ago, I was like, you know what? Windows 10 came out. I'm going to get Windows 10 for my phone, which is a, it was a brilliant idea. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's like beta and cutting edge. So I download it, and I'm like, you have two options. One's slow upgrade, one's fast. I'm like, give me all the fast ones, man. Every time they check something, and I want it on my phone. So the next day, I, I wake up, my phone, hey, I updated it overnight. And like, it's not working. It, the Wi-Fi won't work. And how do I update it? It only updates over Wi-Fi. So that's what happens if the cadence is too fast. You might be on the bleeding edge instead of the leading edge. 
So the answer I came up with has to do with that I have issues. No, no, I mean, GitHub has issues. There are GitHub, there are issues. You can create issues for your code. So, t so take the time and plan these. And map out a development plan. At this point, you're not just a developer. You're almost like a project manager. You have to really start thinking about how other people are going to step into this, because that's what you want. You want other people to jump in there. Break it down into small, easily completed steps. Think about the fact that someone could look at an issue and say, I can tackle that. That's how you want an issue to be. It might just be a defect. It might be you add this code. It could be this thing needs documented. If you go into mine, there's please help. No, seriously, I need help text. So um, what I did was I looked at the SDK that m mine's built upon. It has all these functions. I was like, well, I'll just create one SDK function will become an issue. So <laughs> I ended up with, like the day after, 236 issues. So. And that was a good time to start drinking. Um, but it was interesting, I, and this spawned a little side trip called Posh Hub that I created, which allowed me to take the reflected functions out of my C Sharp library and suck them into a PowerShell script that created the issues automatically for me in, uh, in uh, GitHub. So that was kind of cool. I just I ended up with a little, and it doesn't have a readme. This has every mistake in the world. I just created it to do it. But, it, but I mean, it, I can add milestones, and I can get them, and I can get issues, and I can create issues. And that was pretty cool. So I, I had this little side trip for a day or two that I got another little project to work on because we, none of us have enough to do, right? So then you got issues. You want to turn them into milestones. So and the milestones, you don't want to make too big. And that was another mistake I made. I was like, well, my, my milestone is going to be object storage is impl implemented. Well, that was only 14, but this like, databases was 32 different issues. And that job went for a couple weeks coding that. So what I had to do internally for my managers to know that I was, I mean, they can look at this, but what I did was like, well, there's database, there's routines to create a database and ones to query your databases and one to change root password and and create a database instance and all. So I broke those down into separate little mini milestones that I did internally. And that's where I found out about Waffle.io. Does anyone here use Waffle.io? If you do an open source project, I, I absolutely, I'm in love with this. What happens is you, you go into this, it's free, so I, which I'm not a big fan of free software because that means it could go away or you're the product, you know what I mean? But it's working for me now. It's gr it works really very well. You set up your stuff, <laughs> your backlog, and then you, you, it's like if you've used Trello or anything, you drag and drop them over to the columns. And then it, it creates little flags on your issues in GitHub. So if you go into GitHub, you'll see that these will say in progress. And then when you're done, you move them over here. If you move them over here, it closes them in GitHub. Or if you close it in GitHub, it moves them here automatically. They're, they're linked together. It's an awesome tool for managing, and I live by this. So what I'll do is at the beginning of a sprint, I'll, I'll take and grab similar issues, like set, update, 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 and I'll drag them into that column and say, this is what I'm doing this week. We do one-week sprints at Rackspace. And then as I work, get them finished, set, set, see the verbs? You, maybe you can't see them. I drag them over there, and that's how, this is where I do my mini milestones I was talking about. Like this might be 40 items, but this might be seven or eight. And as I drag them over there, and then at the end of the week, I just go in and look at here, and I go into, uh, well, our, I don't know what the management system we have, we use Trello and all that, but that's how I keep track of what I'm doing. It's a great little tool. Another cool tool is Gitter IM. It allows you to do conversations about your, your project, um, I have mixed feelings about this because maybe these conversations should be in the issues. Uh, but these, a lot of them are outside the issues. Like the, the wiki page is way out of date. It doesn't include anything I worked on. Just thanks for the link, blah, 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 blah. I recommend moving away from the wiki. So it's kind of ancillary information. It does show up in your repo and there's a link to it in your repo. So this is kind of a nice little tool if you're looking for a tool. So, glorious day, I finally had my full first pull request. That's a big deal, that was awesome. 
So I was like, okay, fire up the public relations man, we're going global. So I, I got on out on Twitter, started tweeting stuff out, got some other people in the company, I got some feedback, and I was like, wait, wait, what, what? <laughs> I did what wrong? So at this point, you're gonna start getting feedback. This is where you had the thick skin, you put on the fire suit, and get ready for some serious constructive criticism. And realize, you have to take everything with a positive intention that people tell you. And some people don't have way with words. Sometimes there's a cultural difference where in their culture, you just be straightforward. I live in Pennsylvania, Dutch country, and that's kind of how people are up there, you know? I mean, they'll just come up to you and be just blunt with you. Like, that was stupid. Oh, okay. Sorry, Mom. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> so I got feedback from a guy named Jerry Snover. Maybe you've, you've heard of him. He invented posh, PowerShell. I'm like, oh, I got feet. What, what? I named stuff wrong? He said there's no plurals in PowerShell. And he said that's because of culture and different cultures and stuff. I'm like, oh, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. So guess what? So who's doing the breaking changes now? This guy. I'm going back and taking all the plurals out. So God help anybody that used it. Remember I said earlier about maybe planning ahead and making breaking changes? Well, I did that. So hallelujah. Um, and then what about security? I don't have any security built into it. I don't have them signed. Like, I still don't. <laughs> I know I have to do that. And then they, so it's... And what did I tell you? It's a public project. It's so easy to forget that when you're working on it. It's a public project. You don't own this. So it's open to public distribution and criticism. And so you have to get ready for that. And public bug reporting. But also public help. And that's the cool thing. Now that you have it up on GitHub, if you start getting feedback, there's a magic phrase you need to learn. We accept pull requests. That's the great leveler. The only good, one of the good things about a public project like this is when people are critical, you can say, well, we accept pull requests. You, you're open to fix it. It's a public project. You don't own this, but at the same time, if they're gonna criticize you, it's like, well, you can help. And that is what happened to me. I had people who were like, well, you did this wrong. I'm like, oh, how should I have done it? And then they fixed it. It's like, awesome. And that's what you wanna get to. So at this point, I'm like, help is on the way. I was at, we had a conference internally, and everybody's like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then this happened. Nothing. Nobody was doing anything. I, this was in March this past year. It just died. All the interest I had in it just went away. And I guess I didn't feed the public relations machine or whatever. There was this big lull. Nothing helped. And I was doing all the work myself. Uh, but you just have to power through. If you believe in the project and you think it's really good, this is where you have to put your nose to the grindstone. And then another mistake I made that someone mentioned earlier. <laughs> I was licensing? What, what licensing? What is that? I never, I'm a, I mean, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just writing code. You can take it. Well, how do I know that? Oh, because I put it out on the internet and everything on the internet's free, right? Apparently not. Apparently they have laws about windows and stuff stealing uh, using it so I have to do licensing apparently Apache 2 is the most liberal license there is if you want pe that's what I was told if you want people to use it so I still have to do this so I lost momentum at this point and now it's just work but then going forward on your project you have to ask yourself does it have an endpoint or does it constantly evolve by that I mean, are you writing uh, an add-in for an IDE that's gonna do one function, and once it works well, it's done? Because that, that could be. Or is this something that's gonna continue to grow? My project is, kinda has both, in that once I get it aligned up to the SDK, I'm done. I've, I've got all the functionality into it. That's the end point. However, as the SDK continues to mature, I'll never, it's like, Work around the house, you're never done. There's always something else. Uh, but that's the other thing you have to consider is if it has an endpoint, go back to your readme in that and make sure it's in there. This is the goal, this is how we know it's finished, and this is what's done. The final advice I have, I told let you out early, is just do it. Just do it. If you have an open source project, don't worry about the mistakes, don't worry about the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
just go ahead and do it. I would totally encourage you, make all the mistakes I made and more and do it. It's been very rewarding. Um, going forward, I have people inside the company that are using it now to help customers. And that's the most rewarding thing. I mean, I, that's, what else could there be that your software's actually being used in the real world for people that are actually doing stuff? There's a lot of actuallys in there. <clears throat> and that's all I have. This is up on GitHub, this whole talk. If you saw my name earlier, or if you want to ask, it's GitHub slash Donchank, D-O-N-S-C-H-E-N-C-K. And if you go there, I have a bunch of technical debt along with this, <laughs> projects I've started. And you can get this and you can fork it and I, I didn't put a license on it, but I will. <laughs> um, but that's all I have. Any questions? Please ask questions. No one. I did that. The what? The law. Yes, yeah, there's, it, it's funny, you start out, there's all this excitement, and even other people that are ancillary to you will be like, oh yeah, that's great. I mean, I was at a conference, people coming up, oh, your project's awesome, it's just great. And then a month later, there's nothing. It's like, where'd you all go? You were gonna write documentation. Oh, I'm sorry, um, I'm going on vacation. No, you're not. Uh, well, I'm in June, this is March. But it, it just was that kind of stuff. And, I mean, that's where you just have to keep at it, and that's, that's when it becomes work. It's just work, and it gets boring. And I have to be honest, like the last week, I didn't do anything. I worked on my presentation and, and got down to inbox zero, because it's, it's, that's it. Yeah, when I mean, you don't want to do any work. It's like, I'm doing administrative work, and then you delete email. I just, it just gets so, after a while, it just gets to be work, but you have to do it. I mean. Is this the Node.js? No. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he finally committed it, and then he goes, okay, that's a good change. It's going to be part of the next one. He redid what I did, but he ended up getting what I needed fixed anyway. Mm -hmm. And then that just kicked me off onto oh, my gosh. everything. Uh, uh, that you know, contribute, contribute, contribute. I've gone to other projects and found an issue, and then you know, contributed to it. Because I got that feedback of, now it's in place. You make, it, uh, you make an excellent point. The point he made was that as a contributor, you can hit a law where you can, you can, uh, what's the verb? A, post a pull request. Submit a pull request and it goes nowhere. And from a contributor standpoint, first, that's like, that's how you kill con contributors. Just ignore them. Just, uh, don't do that. But when you contribute to something and you say pull request and nothing happens on it, it's so frustrating. And I have a project and it worked. Like I, I submitted a pull request on a Node.js thing and it's sitting there for like three weeks. I'm like, what? And the, the, of course the guy in charge is my manager so I can't like beat him up. <laughs> I mean, I think I could take him physically, but I mean, uh, but yeah, you, you don't wanna, don't do that to contributors. Even if you only do is go into the pull request and leave a comment like, thank you for this and I will get to it as soon as I can, but just don't ignore pull requests, please. That's another huge mistake. I haven't made that mistake. That's why it's not up here. I, I, no, I haven't. I'm really good about when people contribute because I'm like, oh, you want to contribute? Thank you, thank you. I'll remember you at Christmas. I'm like anything just to get them to, to contribute. And I've had about seven people contribute and that's, you know, you got to start somewhere. Anything else, other comments? Anybody else has to add? That'd be great. Okay then, well, you're, we're done. Yeah. Go on. <laughs>